story and we had the chance to full on overreact. And we did not because we didn't want to be seen as overreacting. We chose restraint because we are journalists, because we have a sense of perspective, yes. and I cannot wait to blow that. Yeah, that got us nowhere. That, that did nothing, nothing for us. Think Lesson of, learned. Who's more excited? Who were people more excited yesterday about our restraint or about what's about to go down? Because today. a lot is going down today, Bo. So much is going down. We we gave him our third take. Here is our first name. Draymond Green. That's how we're starting this, because Draymond was suspended without pay for last night's game after reportedly calling Kevin Durant the B-word multiple times during Monday's game. We were not sure yesterday how big of a deal this really was, but how does it feel today? This is a problem, right? I, mean, I don't think there's any way around this fact. It's not the sort of problem that a team cannot play through. It is possible that they are able to play through this. But they wound up in this situation where Draymond Green was in the wrong. Yes. He should have passed the ball, right? Should have. And then he said a bunch of stuff that had nothing to do with <laughs> what they were talking about, but stuff that other people maybe agree with, right? And so none of this exists in a vacuum. It's gone past the point of people being able to say, I'm sorry and everything's okay. And now they got to hold this all the way together after publicly rebuking him? This is a relationship type argument. And by that, I mean, the argument that is on the surface is not the actual argument. The tip is the random turnover in November against the Clippers that forces overtime. The iceberg is how Kevin Durant feels about being on a team that does not seem to result in all of the adulation he hoped for. It results in a free agency situation that clearly, Bo, reading these articles, Draymond said some stuff that other people in that locker room were feeling in terms of why isn't Kevin Durant all in in the way that Draymond and Klay Thompson are. Right, but none of them wanted to hear it right then, right? Everyone agrees this was not the time. Even Klay Thompson, A, thought the shot was ridiculous, and then for Marcus Thompson at the Athletic, Clark Atlanta University alum, he has in his story that it was Klay Thompson saying something in the locker room yes. that made everybody realize, oh man, this thing has gotten a little bit bananas as to what's going on here, but let's think about what this suspension meant, because I think that this is going to be the hard part for them. They could not just quietly find him and then back away from it. The reason was we all saw the fight. So if they were to then come after that and then try to say, no, nah, Draymond, we just don't want to play it on a back-to-back, -back, that wasn't going to work after that happened. But we're talking about a dude who has ingratiated himself with the front office over all these mm -hmm. years. And now management said, you two guys are having a beef. We are taking his side. And oh, by the way, we really want him to stay what does that say to you if you're Draymond Green? Yeah, the message being sent here wasn't even to Draymond. Because Draymond could look at all of this and say, man, I should probably rethink my behavior. I don't ever want to harsh Clay Thompson's mellow. <laughs> but that's not what his reaction would be historically. It really is about sending a message to Kevin Durant, which is, you are the better player. You might be the second best player in this league. If we had to choose between you per ownership, per Joe Lacob, who has made not so subtle hints whether it's in that ring ceremony or whether it's in having KD dress up like a construction worker at the opening of that new arena just a couple days ago. They're trying to tell KD, you are our guy if we have to choose in this scenario. Yeah, and by the way, that's a dangerous choice for you to make because I think Draymond Green is actually more important to what they're doing with Kevin Durant. I think if you get Draymond Green off that team, that is less likely mm -hmm. to be a title team than it is that's one fair. with Kevin Durant. I think you could find a more... Not that you could find a player as good as Kevin Durant, but you could find a player or players to provide what he provides. Draymond Green is a unicorn in a way that even seven-foot-tall two-guard Kevin Durant is not. But you hit on a big thing. You're right. They basically looked at him and they said, hey, we've got to pick one guy we're going to pick this dude we're going to choose publicly him as, the, right, as the one to keep the only thing about that as i hear it the rest of the team seems to have been comported themselves this year as though he stays he leaves we don't care we're done babying this dude and the owner's like i'm not i actually would love to come baby him right now and in fact if we may show the video of kd after this game you will see the face of a man who isn't quite over any of this if we can roll that hey kevin have you and draymond been able to hash anything out no. Did, did he cross the line with anything last night that was said? I'm going to keep that in house. That's, that's, what, uh, that's what we do here. I mean, of course he crossed the line. He got suspended. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. And by the way, like, it's not the B word. That's not an issue here. I think we all kind of assumed that Draymond Green had some Eric Cartman in him. Like, this is language that's not shocking. But it's the idea that you're going to throw all of the things that NBA Twitter has been joking about 
into someone's face on camera. But also, I, I, I don't want us to get to this place where we are minimizing the B-word sort of thing. Like, if Kevin Durant punched him in the face for that, I wouldn't have a problem with it, and none of us would, hmm. right? I mean, like, like I want to be careful that we get a, what, you going to get mad because somebody did that to you? I mean, no, no, no. That is going too far. A workplace should have yeah, lines. Yeah, but it's normally addressed in-house in a way that this was not, right? That is where the, the difference comes in on this. And also, Draymond apparently be hollering at people all the time. Everybody in that room is probably tired of Draymond hollering at them. Everybody in that room Steve is all hurt. But everybody in that room is also tired of Kevin Durant's free agency. They just all tired, and that's what brings dynasties down more than anything else. Fatigue. The internal stuff. Next name is Le'Veon Bell. Did report to Steelers camp yesterday. Finally, and finally, signaled his decision to sit out the entire season, giving up $14.5 million. Pablo, was Le'Veon's plan this season a success? So it was a success, but it also wasn't a plan. Like, if you walked into this season as Le'Veon Bell and you said to yourself, I want to make sure that I get my guaranteed money and I want to make sure that I get a long-term deal after this season, what he did was rational. It was extreme because it cost $14.5 million in the process, but it was rational. If Le'Veon Bell has nightmares about Earl Thomas Bo breaking his leg and being carted off sadly, if he has nightmares about any of the countless players he's seen get injured brutally and jeopardize their whole futures, I don't blame him, but there was no plan. We saw this unfold week by week in a way that was so disorganized. Yeah, like that's what's weird because it is possible that there was a plan. It is possible that the plan was for him to come in at this last minute. But then we had heard that people figured out that the Steelers probably couldn't tag him again. Oh, right, and yes. then maybe there was a new plan. But the, what leads to the belief that there wasn't a plan was they never had any leverage, right? Like after this season got started, it wasn't as though they could extract anything yep. by withholding information. He could have very easily come in there and said, look, I'm going to come in at the last possible moment. I'm going to come in after the bye week. We had gotten the word that he was thinking about coming in during the bye week. They looked disorganized in a way that made it legit for the players who typically don't get involved in situations with other people's money for them to be like dude what in the world is this where I disagree with people though is the idea when they say he cost himself 14 well and that's a half the next dollars yes he did not get that 14 and a half million dollars he was said to get he also didn't get those probably 400 touches of wear and tear that they were going to put on his body and it wasn't as, it wasn't like the Steelers were like hey if you just show up here we'll give you 14 and a half million dollars they're like no you show up we'll give you 14 and a half million dollars and then we're going to run you into the ground the fact that he didn't get run into the ground matters yes the mileage on a running back that does matter and if the James Conner end of things looked like Man, James, that Le'Veon Bell made the wrong decision because James Conner is actually pretty good. The counterpoint is James Conner has had 200 or so touches through nine games. That alone is proof that Le'Veon Bell, if mileage is your concern, that's what you want to avoid. Now, the fact that he looks like a worse teammate, the fact that his coaches couldn't trust him in the way that you'd want communication, lines of communication to be open, those are also valid concerns, but is it going to prevent, Bo, the Jets from making an offer to him and oh, paying him all that well, money? Well, the thing figures. is, the thing we talk about there, all that's eradicated if he signs a contract. Like, this is a fairly particular circumstance that he was in. Last name. Carmelo Anthony. Tracy McGrady said yesterday on the jump that Melo should retire because hanging around would just diminish his legacy. Mello is 34. Does T Max advice make sense to you? Well, I think it also probably comes from an interesting place from Tracy McGrady, who's a guy that stayed after his prime, but his prime was hacked into by injuries, right? Yes. You know, like, so his situation was different. He was so good for injury. Yeah, oh my God. But, but with Mello, stay for what? Like, what exactly is it that he's continuing to go for? It seems that he has in his mind a certain role that he believes that he should have or mm -hmm. a role that he wants to have. There's no team worth a damn that's going to give him that role. Like, does he want to roll out like Allen Iverson on a bad Sixers team, looking bad in the process after getting run out of Memphis in that situation? Right. Is that what he wants? He's got all the money in the world. I would need to know what it is that Melo is still playing for. Because, hell, Vince Carter's still out here playing, right? It is not diminishing his legacy. Yeah, but Vince Carter seems to have a greater comfort, as Tracy McGrady explained, in doing so. If you are a guy who has delusions of grandeur, then yeah, you don't want to do this. And by the way, the banana boat here does figure in. LeBron is still in the league. Chris Paul is still in the league. D. Wade is still in the league. It is worth noting that Melo never actually got on the banana boat. Gabrielle Union did because he was afraid of the paparazzi making him look bad because he would look silly. I asked Carmelo Anthony now, 
Do you want to avoid that happening with your NBA career? Well, here's the thing. Does he look silly if he's on a team that we don't care about? Uh, coming up next, Steve Kerr talking about fighting Michael Jordan. Ooh. High Noon is brought to you by Modelo Especial, brewed with a fighting spirit since 1925. River deck at Pier 17. How annoyed do you think Steph Curry was? And they were like, yo, you got to go to Draymond House and talk about it. I think Steph Curry is the rare guy who can relate to these people, man. Right, that'll mean, he, that'll mean he feel like it. Yeah, Draymond at home, walking in, yeah. opening the door, Steph lights Curry, off. And, yeah, and <laughs> Steph Curry got to come in and talk to you like he's your daddy. I'm very disappointed in how that <laughs> went. First quote. By the way, I kicked MJ's ass. Said Steve Kerr when speaking about altercations between NBA teammates, according to Mark Spears of The Undefeated. Do you believe Kerr's of his account of now, his fight with MJ? Now, this is an interesting thing because there are two legendary instances of Michael Jordan punching somebody in a practice. One of them was Will Perdue, who, by the way, Michael Jordan used to call Will Vanderbilt because he said he didn't deserve to be named after an, a Big Ten school. <laughs> then there was this wow. fight that he had with Steve Kerr. And the difference is it is categorized as a fight. Now, Steve Kerr, by the way, a bit taller than people realize. Yes. I would not be surprised if he had Same. a little something. You're, he's like six inches taller than you. But if we could get this footage, Whoa. this is the only footage I know of that I can recall of Michael Jordan being in a fight. And this is him and Reggie Miller, right? This is the first three-peat. That happened. Mike came for him. Ooh, now, all I'm, all I'm saying is this. There's no evidence there to indicate that, hmm. well, anybody involved in this can actually <laughs> fight. So I'm going to say Steve Kerr had a fighting chance in this, and I will say that your assumption that Steve Kerr does not have a fighting chance in this might be, you know, a byproduct of profiling. Stereo stereotypes. Yeah. But the thing I love about the fight with Steve Kerr as we watch MJ just sort of, yeah, just face mush Reggie Miller Maybe there. Maybe Armstrong. It's that the Kerr and MJ fight happened in training camp. Like, yes. this was a training camp thing. It was because MJ had just lost to the Magic the year before after coming out of retirement. And Steve Kerr apparently got in his face with some trash talk because Steve Kerr has some of that in him too. MJ gave him the forearm shiver according to historical record. And then suddenly they were on top of each other and punches were being thrown. All of which is to say that that was the year they went 72 and 10. Yeah, I, I do have to say, though, that I don't know how I'd handle it if Steve Kerr started talking noise to me. And Steve Kerr is an NBA player, and I just work here. I also think about this in the course of watching this video that we just showed. Yes. Maybe the best story of anybody in anything close to a fight with Michael Jordan. Jordan once in practice got mad at Bill Cartwright because he just always got frustrated with Bill Cartwright. And he told dudes in practice not to pass the ball to Bill Cartwright anymore. Bill Cartwright came to him after practice and explained to him that he was maybe the greatest basketball player that he had ever seen. And if you do anything like that again, you'll never play basketball again. <laughs> right, Bill Cartwright, all this right here. Yep, oh, yep. no, no, no. Bill Cartwright's like, I will elbow you in the head so hard that you will never be able to count. Michael Jordan is the ultimate example to all of these scenarios, right? You guys hate each other, blah, blah, blah. Well, Michael Jordan was a tremendous jerk, and guess yeah, what? But Everyone loves those rigs. Yeah, but guess what? He's Michael Jordan. Kevin Durant is not. Next quote, he's losing control of this team. Said former Eagles receiver Jason Avant about Philly head coach Doug Peterson. Pablo, how much do you trust Avant's assessment? I don't know. Jason Avant isn't on the team. Jason Avant, I assume, is watching these games closely, in which case he has probably seen that a lot is wrong with the Eagles right now. But it's not just one player. It's not just one position. It's sort of injuries to the secondary. It's the fact that the offensive line is hurt. It's the fact that Carson Wentz isn't as good as Carson Wentz was pre-injury last year. And in cases like that, Bo, you tend to blame the coach. You tend to blame Doug Peterson, apparently, even if he, you know, won the Super Bowl. No, but see, that would be the case if he was just saying something broad and just being like, they're not winning, therefore the coach is the problem. That's not what he's doing. He's pointing to very particular things, and he's talking about stuff like attention to detail. Like, if we look at this play that they had at the end of the first half against the Cowboys, when the Cowboys are marching down the field and the Cowboys are trying to hurry up and right, line up at right. the end of that possession. The urgency. And, and you've got guys on the Eagles that are walking back there. Those are the things that make you point to the head coach because by the logic of a guy like Avant is that if you got the proper respect for your head coach, you know that sort of thing would not be tolerated. Like, people will look at something like that and they'll be like, they wouldn't have done that if Bill Belichick was the coach. And think about how many times you've seen the Patriots walk up and down the field. So, yes, I agree with you that they're probably ascribing a lot of things. You know, people are ascribing a lot of things and putting it on the coach. Yes. But for the kinds of things he's talking about, 
that is what you look at the coach for. No, and that's fair. The example of urgency and effort and when that flags is fair, but there's also just like the turnover issue, right? Yeah. The Eagles but, have a turnover but, but, problem. But when teams, they didn't last when teams year. have bad turnover margins, we typically look at the coach. Last quote. I feel like I learned. I feel like a lot of guys wanted him to stay. I learned a lot from him, and I was still learning. Said Andrew Wiggins about Jimmy Butler. Joel Embiid reportedly called Wiggins to ask what Butler was like as a teammate and got glowing reviews. Wiggins also said he definitely wanted Butler to stay. So does this surprise you? Uh, not necessarily, because apparently when Jimmy had that crazy day at practice, Andrew Wiggins dapped him up he did on, on the way, way out. out. <laughs> like, we have assumed that a lot of Jimmy's ire is pointed toward Andrew Wiggins. And he did say that Andrew Wiggins is the most talented guy on the team and talked yes. about how high he could jump in his hands, hands and everything else. But I take what we're saying, what we're learning here, Basically, Jimmy really didn't like Carl Anthony, Anthony Towns. Towns. Like, oh, this is very, oh. very particular to how he <laughs> felt about Carl Anthony Towns. And for whatever reason, you got all the sympathy in the world for Carl Towns. I do. And, I, and for Andrew Wiggins, Andrew Wiggins is not good at basketball in the way that Carl Anthony Towns is good at basketball. But Andrew Wiggins also isn't deaf. Andrew Wiggins <laughs> saw the news cycle, saw how everyone responded when Carl Anthony Towns dared to defy the iron fist of Jimmy Butler, and Andrew Wiggins just wants hold all on, of us to hold know. Hold on, hold on. What did Carl Anthony Towns do to defy the iron fist? Well, it was mostly getting hit with the iron yeah, fist and then I, being I, like, I, I, I was hit by I, the iron I, 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 fist. Say, what in the world did he do to defy was, the iron it fist? It was expressed displeasure at the fist. I just, I just can't fist. figure out all you Team Towns people in this situation. I just feel sad for a guy who is sad. That's all it is, Bo. Who do you think, who, who, who do you think was more unhappy at work? Carl Anthony Towns or Jimmy Butler? Jimmy Butler seemed to be pretty unhappy at work. After the break. How many points are going to be scored in this game that is no longer in Mexico? Because apparently... Yeah, Chiefs-Rams. It's kind of a big deal. Might be a lot. Yeah. A whole lot. Download this show as a podcast. Bomani's too. Check out mine too if you... So apparently Kevin Durant's brother got on to Instagram. Oh, he, Tony back? Yeah, he popped off a little bit about this because that's always making things better. Wasn't he the guy who commented on Instagram, got to fill up the hand before we get out of here back in October? I love that we, like you play for them. Today's number, 64. That's the point total over under for Monday night's Chiefs-Rams game, which is the highest since 1985. Yesterday, the NFL announced the game will be moved from Mexico City to Los Angeles because of poor field conditions at Estadio Azteca. How excited are you for this game? I mean, I am looking forward to this. This should be a lot of fun, like separate from the fact that it's two good teams. It's two teams that are very entertaining to watch. Yes. And look, I don't care about whether they play that game in Mexico. I was going to be watching it on TV, so it really wasn't going to be no difference as far as I was concerned. If that field was as sludgy and sloshy as they said it was, then there's no way I want to watch this no, game on that. No. Like, if you got some three yard in a cloud of dust stuff oh and you want to play it on that, Lord. that's fine. But get this on the fastest track we can. I wish they go play it somewhere in a dome. Yes, can we get the turf? Can we get the dome? This is like ordering a nice, like, Kobe steak and getting ketchup on it. No, you want to preserve this in the conditions it was meant to be acquired and tasted and maximized and... The over-under total here, Bo, is like a fun historical note, but it's also kind of the culmination of a larger NFL rebranding process. The league is about offense. The sport is about offense. And the best way to ensure that you get offense, you have these two teams play against each other. No, there will be points. There will be lots of yes. How sad will we be if this is like 17-14? No, it, I, you know, like Marcus Peters... Like, oh. if you're out there, I know you want to, like, make good on your talk, but just not this week. Well, he's got to look at Wade Phillips like, hey, man, am I, you really, with Tyree, you, you really want me to? Oh, no. I mean, all right, homie, you feel me? In close, I'd like to ask a couple of questions about what's going on in these good folks' engagement photos taken by J.C. Marie Photography. See oh. you. As you'll see, there's a lovely couple at an Ohio brewery taking photos to commemorate putting a down payment on a reception hall. Then look what happens. That's right. Oh, I put it the wrong way. Wait a minute. He just pops up in that picture. <laughs> That's right. He's just right there. And part, yes. That's amazing. Part of the question that I have about this is, what's the temperature outside? Because I know people want to look cute in their pictures, but he got all the bulletproof <laughs> bubble in that coat. They must have been freezing their behinds off sitting up there in the front. I just like how we went from Dave Chappelle being 
gone from the world. He yes. went to Africa. He was off in the lab somewhere hidden. And now he's just popping up everywhere. Although, to be fair, when we thought he was in the lab hidden, he was hiding in Ohio. Yes, right, like this, this, is, this is where he was. Everybody knows where Dave Chappelle lives, except the last place you would expect to see Dave Chappelle is just posted up in Ohio. Dave Chappelle had us on a bus in Louisiana. Yes, we had no idea where we swamp, were going. No idea to see him, and it was worth it. It was, it was totally worth it. In closing, I'd like to show you the latest from Mac McClung, Georgetown's foremost cultural exchange student. Let's watch. Oh, let's see what he did. Oh, okay. A layup. Nice layup. What we got here? Oh! There we go. Okay, he ain't scared. He is attacking Nothing the rim else. with abandon. I don't think that counts as attacking the rim. Uh, so much. Yeah. Not that one. Yeah. But here we go. Rim there we attack. Go. That was impressive. Remember, I'll tell you how to wait for it. This is why. <laughs> Mac McClung, man, is out here. And the reason I bring him up is because he has a cousin. And I know you don't like me calling him White Mac for reasons I understand. But roll the video of his cousin because he yeah. figures in. Yeah, like the reason that. is you didn't that get just the shows joke. On a fast break, you're doing that? Oh, rip. Rip rap! That, those type of NBA level statistics. What? That's all, <laughs> those are all star moves. He could play against NBA players right now, but they have that rule you can got to go to college first. So he's going to Georgetown first. We're over here in the first quarter. Riff Raff is McClung's biological cousin.